so Jack, welcome to the reading group. It's been a real delight to engage with your work. I, I think um, you know the piece in Somatosphere is a great summing up of uh, the sinophobic and xenophobic tropes that were at play. You know, not only in the media, but it, it, it was a really good accounting of you know how different images and videos were circulating on on Twitter of bats and soup, <laughs> but you know mixing up places and peoples and languages. And, and also you've offered this delightful essay that offers a multi-species account of, of just the epistemological and ontological uncertainty of um, earlier moments in, in Hong Kong when people were trying to identify multiple kinds of plagues. And, and maybe I'll, I'll just start with one basic question on, on the, um, the historical essay. Uh, just, you know, if, if you could say a little bit more about the apparatuses that were at, at play then. So, you know, now we're living in a world where we have PCR tests, antibody tests, all manner of, of uh, you know, modes of differentiating species, strains, and types. And um, in those days, kind of what, what kinds of technologies were, were folks grappling with as, as they're trying to make these distinctions between different plagues? Mm, yes. Um, well, thanks for thanks for your question, and and indeed for being able to talk. I'm you know really glad to be able to. Um, but on the apparatuses, uh, the answer is extremely crude ones. Um, so of course you know you have bacteriological identification of plague at this point, and William Hunter, who I talk about in in that essay and also in the Somatosphere piece, he was the um, first government bacteriologist in Hong Kong. Um, so you have those uh, still developing practices of uh, laboratory bacteriology, um, but those coexisted with a really quite broad set of alternative techniques. Um, and what you actually see, um, and this is something that segues uh, with Christos's work, um, are lots of other ways of, uh, of trying to identify plague and, and work out what it was. Um, so Hunter, despite being a bacteriologist, also spent a great amount of time um, in the mortuary, um, directly dissecting bodies of both people and of animals and investigating um, changes to internal organs uh, and, and things like that. Um, and one of the things that I've been writing about a bit, I don't bring it out too much in that short essay, um, but I'm sort of working on it now, is that there were direct attempts by Hunter and others um, to work out routes of transmission of plague um, through the direct use of human viscera being fed to domestic animals and then those domestic animals in turn being fed to other creatures in order to work out sort of pathways of infection. Um, so alongside this direct uh, laboratory use of, you know, the microscope and so on, you also have really crude uh, measures using directly human remains um, alongside domestic animals in order to, you know, try and work out what was happening with plague. Um, wow. So pretty crude <laughs> and, and really quite brutal. Mm. And what did people's relatives say? <laughs> I mean, I could imagine that that's mm -hmm. the sort of thing that uh, wouldn't fly in a lot of places. Yeah, indeed. Um, so for the most part, I believe that the bodies that were used um, were from the public mortuary. And these were bodies which had been um, dumped on the streets of Hong Kong in order to avoid um, the repressive sanitary measures that followed from the discovery of um, plague within a household. Mm. So you have this sort of vicious circle, really, that people are dying from plague in order to avoid their household being subjected to these measures. The bodies are, are dumped in um, out of the way areas. And then because of that, the bodies end up being uh, subjected to deeply intrusive and uh, insensitive use. Um, but you also have him experimenting on um, beriberi uh, patients, recently deceased beriberi patients, uh, 
um, he has this horrendous anecdote of him um, extracting brain material from a, a recently deceased uh, patient in a, a Chinese hospital. Um, and there are no records, I've, I've not seen anything which states um, sort of the sensitivities around the body in, in, in that circumstance. Um, but for the most part, he was using these bodies that were, um, were sort of, which had already been abandoned. Mm. Mm. Um, thereby obviating sort of the, some of the, the, the sensitivities, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and kind of doing Whiggish uh, medical history, like what, what do we know about the transmit? You know, we know the flea story, we know, you know, the basics of Yersinia pestis, but um, can we tell more complicated multi-species stories like in a Whiggish way, hey, like looking, looking at what we know today about what Yersinia can do and can't do like, is, is it getting around in some of these, like in carrion and, and some of these uh, uh, chains of other organisms eating each other? Mm, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I, I, as Christos mentioned the other day, um, there are some 230 or mammals which are actually capable of transmitting plague. And so this reduction to the rat theory was sort of um, problematic even on those, those Whiggish terms, like you say. Um, and there have been other cases, there were suspicions um, in the Middle East, I think Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, of there having been isolated cases of plague transmission through the um, consumption, I think, of camel meat, um, which has that parallel with the sorts of discussions that you have regarding, you know, the eating of putatively infective meat in Hong Kong at this time. Um, and in the early 20th, 21st century, when you have great concerns over bioterror, um, post, you know, the anthrax scares and 9-11, and there was research done again about the capacity of plague to be transformed into a, a bioweapon. And one of the interests there was on the um, possibilities of plague being transmitted through food, um, sort of recapitulating some of these earlier discussions. Um, there's one particular study I, that stuck in my mind, which looked at the um, capacity of bubonic plague to be spread through a bagged salad. Um, and that sort of, you know, it, it's, it's a recovery of, in some ways of those earlier questions regarding um, plague and consumption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Others should definitely feel free to uh, jump in with questions in the chat or un unmute yourself. Um, also, uh, jumping back to your somatosphere essay, I, I was just really curious about the sorts of uh, vigilante justice that has, has emerged in, in those spaces. You, you kind of allude to the ways that, um, you know, folks are doxxed or outed or, or whatever after they're making particularly egregious, incorrect claims. And um, how much have you traced that and, and how much real work does it do in the world in terms of shutting down some, some of those commentaries. Mm, yes. Um, I mean, I've not traced it in particular depth, but for the most part, I think the, all of the, lots of those efforts at debunking and fact checking and the exposure of fake news only has limited capacity to really change much at all. I mean, you know, I talked about a few specific, um, examples in that essay of this sinophobic linking of disease with Chinese food. Um, and whereas perhaps you can push back against those specific actors, the way that these claims sort of meld into a much broader discourse is I think quite resistant against the work of, of fact checking. And in mm -hmm. some ways, I, I considered the somatosphere piece as an attempt to push beyond the fact checking paradigm. You know, it's all very well exposing the falsity of a claim, but these claims are built out of such a long and durable history that I think there's a great degree of skepticism due over the actual work that they can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that'd be my suggestion there. And I, you know, with the piece I wanted to, to uncover and, and look back at that, that longer story and 
And those histories of the racist, uh, sinophobic identification of food with disease um, as being, uh, you know, part of the, the dynamo behind the claims being made now. Yeah, su super important work. Just curiosity, um, you know, what do you, what do you make of these cold chain claims uh, that are articulated in the WHO report and, and in the media? I mean, it seems to be adjacent to or directly related to at least some of these these other ways you're seeing um, things circulate in food. Mm, yes, yes. Um, I mean, that would be something that Frederick will know a lot more about than me. Um, but I think perhaps that's interesting in touching on um, one of the things that has slipped outside out of the discussion, which is the association within China um, of disease and food and food practices in, in different ways. Um, so I was in uh, Shandong, in northern China, um, just around the time of the Wuhan outbreak. Um, and as I opened the somatosphere piece uh, with, with this anecdote, there was a great deal of um, discussion in China at the time um, regarding the role and the role of um, food in the possible origins of the of the outbreak. Um, so looking through Douyin, which is the Chinese TikTok equivalent, you have sort of I, I, the, the same sorts of videos so, sort of circulating within that um, within that media world that later are, are reused out, outside it. Um, so there was this internal Chinese discourse about the risks of food and disease emergence um, that I think paralleled in some ways later discussions, but have sort of slipped out of the picture now as, um, you know, the epicenters of the pandemic have moved very far away from Wuhan. Um, yeah. So I think there's a, there's a link there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, sir. Thank you so much. That It was a, a great piece. I, I really enjoyed it. I, I'm wondering on, on food practices and kind of medical practices that go parallel. And I don't know how much you have um, sunk your teeth onto, onto that, but um, one, so for instance, when you think about tobacco, if you are a smoker, uh, you could go in two ways. You could argue, no, tobacco is, is completely harmless. It doesn't do anything. On the other hand, if you go to kind of an Amerindian setting, it's one of the most powerful um, medicines you can you can have. It's like the it's for everything. It's there and it's very important. And when you say and so, if you try to argue that it's not doing anything, what you are doing is also saying that it has no effect. So one of the questions is: To what degree are these foods having a role in in medicine, um, which is being obscured in? in trying to say these are innocuous. Mm, yes, interesting. Um, no, really good point. Um, so I think one of the things that I try to do both with that essay and with the somatosphere article is to draw a sort of contrapuntal argument. Um, so showing in all of these ways that you have this really unjust and unrealistic and racist and sinophobic framing of disease and food practices is intimately linked, whilst also keeping in mind the really important um, questions of, of food and sustenance in as being constitutive of, of, of health and disease risks. Um, and so one of the things that I I think is important to, to recognize is that, you know, just as you have all of these claims regarding the infectivity of food in 20th century Hong Kong on the basis of, um, on the basis of its supposed capacity to spread plague, you know, food is also a massive issue of health because you have uh, terrible incidents of beriberi at the same time. And whereas food, um, you know, for, for the most part, wasn't the um, thing to be blamed for the outbreaks of plague in, in Hong Kong. Having a focus on food in relation to beriberi ultimately, you know, worked out. It was, it was justifiable. 
Um, and I think just with um, COVID today, the very correct and necessary work of, of debunking and, and demonstrating the falsity of all of these claims regarding the links between the disease emergence and, and food um, shouldn't let us totally lose sight of the fact um, or lose sight of the, specific, the specificities in which you do have those connections between disease and, and, and food. So for example, I'm interested in, uh, interested degree in, in, in the simultaneity of COVID emergence in, in, in contemporary China and also the preceding um, spread of African swine fever and seeing within the same lens and at the same time um, the spread of those of those two diseases. So, you know, whilst demonstrating the falsity of one claim, it's staying with and taking seriously um, the role of, of food and animals in food production um, on the other hand. Um, so I think that's what I'd, I'd suggest to that. Could you unravel Beriberi a little bit more? I, I, I admit I had to just do a little quick Google research and um, you know the current version is vitamin B1, but how, how is Beriberi understood in, in the period that you're writing about and how is it entangled in these, these mm. food systems? Yeah, so Beriberi is a lot like plague. I mean, you have major incidents of the disease with a, a, a great deal of um, misunderstanding and doubt over its, um, its etiology, its epidemiology. Um, I'm not so certain on all of the specifics, um, but at the time you have debates over whether it's caused by a, by a specific microorganism, you know, whether beriberi will be solved with bacteriology, um, whether it had a link to animals, in particularly insects. So there are investigations of say cockroaches as being involved in the transmission of, of beriberi, um, but also increasingly, um, at least by sort of the time that Hunter was working, an association of beriberi with, with food. Um, and I believe especially an association with um, rice. And the idea that over overly milled rice re, uh, reduces the um, nutritive um, quality of, of rice, um, enabling the, the disease. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately it was that nutri that interest in the nutritive um, quality of rice that ended up being the sort of correct investigative path to take. Um, so, you know, in some ways the the, the the interest in the role of food in the uh, transmission of beriberi ended up proving fruitful in a way that it didn't so much for, for plague. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You, you do a masterful job of, of um, tracing a long genealogy of, of these, um, these racist tropes as, as they pertain to, you know, Orientals eating exotic foods. And, and I wonder if, if there's a similar um, long trajectory that we could point to in terms of uh, what we might call airing articulations, you know, that you, you see, for example, with, with Dr. Fu Manchu, you know, this 1912 British colonial novel that talks about an Asian, evil Asian genius that steals Western knowledge and threatens the downfall of civilization. I mean, you, you see, variations of that theme playing out in all kinds of discourse about ways that China has become modern and become a, um, a, a place that is host to capitalist enterprise and um, how um, certain kinds of food systems get scaled up and, and capital gets concentrated and you know, the speed and velocity of, of food production intensifies. And you know, there's there's certain things that travel transnationally, but then there's also, I think, a specificity for ways that development, let's say, is, is talked about in East Asia. Um, are, are are you seeing seeing that in, in the archive? And are are 
are you also seeing that play out over these longer periods of time up up until because you know some of the early outbreak narratives for example there's this this piece by Vox Media that um, that I ended up writing something about that, that was focused on the wet market and um, forms of of animal um, capital that put you know large large scale enterprises that that involved like you know all kinds of exotic so called exotic animals you know living cheek and jowl and and conditions of confinement. I, I don't know. Do 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 you sort of see what I'm 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 saying in in the sources that you're you're investigating? Mm, to a degree, though I think the current emphasis on the exoticism of the creatures is comparatively newer. I think at the time mm. it was very much a, perhaps more of a sense of a general infectivity of. Of, um, of, of, of animals in, in, in China. So you have a lot of uh, associations between the importation of cattle and swine um, from the coastal ports in, in Guangdong and elsewhere in Southern China um, and outbreaks of disease in, disease in Hong Kong. So I think perhaps there it's, it's less an, an exoticization and more of a generalized um, suspicion and doubt and fear of these of these pathways of food, which are you know transporting very regular very regular items. Um, so I suppose there's a, a bit less of specificity there, um, and I also think that whilst you have the association between sort of overcrowding and disease outbreaks, there's less of a sense of the, of the rapidness and, um, and, 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 and rapid, a rapid transformation and development and changing China now relative to then. Because of course, in many ways, you have the sense of plague being this disease of immemorial past time. And so the disease outbreak is explicable in terms of how China is sort of this primeval, this primeval space um, in which these ancient diseases can, can reappear and, and spread around the modern world. But it's their, it's their primeval, it's their origin in the primeval conditions of China that make that explicable. Um, and perhaps that's still sort of paralleled in discussions today, but I feel it's sort of a sort of a flip. It's sort of flipped now um, to where you have diseases as, as as explicable in terms of um, sort of the rapidity of, of modernity. Hmm. Um, hmm. So I think that's a discursive change there. Super interesting. Yeah. Rachel, I just noticed your question in the, in the chat. Hey, Jack, thanks for being with us today. Um, I really liked both of these pieces and I thought that they were so um, careful, uh, carefully done and um, just really appreciate the way that they uh, sort of extend, uh, one extends the other. Um, I, I'm curious about this quote um, uh, on that, second to, I think it was the last page or second to last page of your, your newest piece um, in which I'll just read it out. The science detailed in this article was capacious yet the expansiveness of its epidemiology was tied to a constricted sphere of human sympathy. Um, and I, in part, maybe it's because I'm thinking about uh, plague places a little bit more. I was just walking with my family at the Villa Agonati, which is the which is a plague villa here in, in Milano. Um, but uh, and thinking about the place, uh, the places that are made uh, or the places that are extended through, um, um, in this case, plague uh, that you're outlining. In this case, the laboratory. Um, but um, I, I'm also struck by the fact that you're kind of you're 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 sort of holding the um, the scholar, the scientist in your hand as 
Kim Tallbearer writes about writing, sort of turning it over in your hand and, and, and analyzing the, the scholar, the, the, the scientist. And you make this turn at the end of your, uh, in, at the end of both of these pieces uh, in, some, in some way. And I guess I was, I was craving more of that from you, um, not because I want to hear more of the terrible, tragic, sort of visceral um, things that you were outlining earlier in our conversation today, but I couldn't help but think of um, MIT scholar Amy Moran's piece on the, uh, the pulse oximeter and, um, you know, and race and racialized science. And, Part of the, the sort of striking thing about that piece uh, is that she outlines the ways in which scientific racism um, falls short uh, in its methodology, not just because of its capacity to harm and, and do this violence, but not least because of in tracing the methodology, in tracing the science itself she is able to show in that piece the ways in which it falls entirely on its face and does not do service to the, to the patients. And I'm just so curious about, um, I'm not trying to sort of compare apples and oranges, but I'm, I'm left with this pondering for you. You are in some ways, you know, uh, doing that as well. It isn't just the archive, uh, the historical archive. You are making these gestures already in your writing. And I'm just so curious to, to see more and hear more from you on, on that. What is it in the, in the methodology um, of this xenophobia and of this colonial history that um, that is revealed, um, or is further revealed. Uh, I don't know if that's the right question I want to ask, but that's what I can <laughs> pull together right now, um, for you. And, um, anyway, it leaves me with a lot, I guess all of this is to say, you know, thank you. And, and it leaves me with a lot, you know, a craving of more, um, uh, from you. I can't wait to see how the, the piece, uh, evolves. Thank you. That's, um, incredibly interesting and, uh, and useful. Um, and I think yes, that's uh, sort of what I'm, what I'm, what I'm driving at. Though perhaps I, like I say, I need to to do more to bring it out. Um, that you know, with Hunter, the scientific conclusions he he reaches come at an end of a process of really quite astonishingly brutal investigative work, um, and it was in some ways his ability to act upon and, and, and brutalize the, the bodies of the, of, of the colonized um, that allow him to, to, to attempt to trace these, these pathways of, of transmission. Um, and so um, the expansiveness of the science, its capacity to, to see interrelations um, its attention to sort of the entanglements of, of human, animal, and you know, material, uh, materiality um, was in many ways predicated on, upon this ability to, um, to, to manipulate and, and employ for all sorts of um, ends the, the bodies of the, the population over which the, the British ruled. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's work that I'm trying to do um, and also, I think um, with Hunter, you have this incredible proximity to, um, to the colonized population. I mean, you know, he's going into hospitals and removing bodies and working on them, um, but also this deep dearth of knowledge and this sort of epistemic gulf between the world in which he moved as a colonial scientist and the actual... Um, realities of Chinese life and Chinese diets and Chinese food practices um, within Hong Kong, um, which ultimately made you know, many of his claims um, quite preposterous because he sim simply didn't understand how um, people were actually eating um, within, the, within the colony. Um, and so I suppose that's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to dig away at. Um, but you've given me a really a lot of uh, food for thought, as it were, there. Um, and there'd be something for me to, to, to reflect over. So thank you. Really interesting. Thanks, Jack. Frederick. Um, hello, Jack. Um, I was interested in your uh, unpublished article by the equivocity of fake and um, 
the work you've done um, at the at the Kennedy port uh, station on on a cattle plague or rinderpest, mm. uh, which for me was surprising because I thought that uh, cattle plague was spread in East Africa, but not in, in Hong Kong. And so I was wondering um, if the same stuff was controlling for plague among rodents and cockroaches and among among cattle. I mean, if, if they really thought that it was the same plague. Mm. Yes. Um, so there were a few measures taken. Um, so I believe that one of the things that was uh, was done was the removal of the incinerator of um, cattle um, from a place where it was thought where it could um, connect with the infection of rats and the, and the, the possibility of spreading plague. Um, but for the most part, it wasn't a sustained set of, of reforms. I mean, a classic case in, in Hong Kong of um, the hopes of, of colonial scientists far outstripping the willingness of colonial states to actually spend money and, and change things. Um, and so I think you have a gulf between the really quite far reaching investigations of these scientists and their capacity to actually put, um, to, to transform these theories and ideas into, into, into action. Um, so I think that's what I would, I would say to that there. And also, you know, um, considerable uncertainty over the possible links of, of Rinderpest and, and plague. Whereas Hunter was a, um, you know, he, he investigated this. Um, another colonial scientist was a real advocate for the theory. There was also, you know, a great deal of, of doubt and ambivalence over whether this, this link was indeed real and was indeed the case. Um, so it was still sort of an unsettled question which I think further prevented its translation into governance. So this equivocation between cattle plague and Yersinia pestis uh, was not corrected on bacteriological evidence. They, they, they could not show that it was not the same bacteria. Mm, so I think it was the case that bacteriology showed that it wasn't identical to Yersinia pestis. But the investigators also thought that neither was it proper Rindpest. And so it existed in sort of this, um, this uncertain um, middle ground, perhaps it could say. And the, it continued to um, spark questions over, over possible links. It was still a question for, for research and investigation. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very interesting because there's the same debate in Europe with um, tuberculosis in, in cows. Um, mm, interesting. Even if it's, not, if it's not the same bacteria, there's debate whether it's the same disease. So mm, interesting. interesting. Really interesting to, to compare. Yeah, it's really interesting. Thank you. This actually relates back to my opening question that I might push a little further on relating to apparatus. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, what what makes the ontological and epistemological cuts in, in these literatures? You know, it, I, and this is speaking largely from ignorance of, you know, is this a moment where we have like different stains that are revealing like this is gram positive, gram negative? Like, is it the gross morphology of the microbe or what? Like, how, how are these being differentiated? I mean, you, you talked about the, um, sort of the, the um, I don't know how to characterize it, <laughs> the feeding of viscera to other animals as one mode of, of you know, one diagnostic modality, but in, in, you know, that relentless project of visualization and isolation and um, the attempt to, you know, localize, um, you, you know, with this very new germ theory, um, the, the, the thing in, in the microbe, like how, how are they distinguishing Yersinia from render pest, or when, when do those terms even come into existence? Mm. So um, the terms were in use, though they called it um, Bacillus pestis at the time. There's still uncertainty about the role of Yersin in uh, versus uh, Shibastaburo kitasato in the 
in the identification of the disease. So they were speaking this scientific language of, of bacilli uh, and so on. Um, and they were certainly looking at the morphology of the microorganism, and that as being one of the keys to differentiate plague from these other diseases. Um, I think what was suggested later on was that the technology had simply not reached the point at that time at which it could reliably differentiate between bubonic plague and these other diseases that were being seen in, in cattle and so on. Um, so that's what was suggested uh, later on. Um, um, but yes, there's certainly that drive towards um, bacteriological specificity, but in some ways the bacteriology opened up more questions than it, it closed down. Um, and when that happened, you have all of these alternative and supplemental um, routes of investigation in order, to, in order to work out what this thing actually was. Um, a little like what you know, Christos has talked about with um, attention, uh, ethnographic attention to surrounding customs um, regarding disease transmission. I think there were those other um, supplemental routes of investigation um, when the bacteriology could open questions um, but couldn't close them down. Um, Super interesting. I'm also just wondering, you know, at, at this moment in history, are, I, I know like later on, so like say by the 1950s, you, you have this, um, this discourse emerging that now one might consider post-Pasturian, you know, in, in, in the tradition of, of Heather Paxson and, and others that, um, you know, there's, there's the majority of microbes out there are, are kind of symbiotic or, or neutral or, um, not going to have a serious impact on human health, but at this at this moment, is it just you know every bug we can see is likely a pathogen? Is is that kind of the the way of thinking? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, they don't talk about it too much. I think there is sort of this real tunnel vision towards the specific microorganism which is is causative of the. Uh, of a, of, of a disease. Um, and so when they're doing these, they're doing these tests, they're looking immediately for this, this single bacillus. Um, and I think, I, I, th I would say that other microorganisms sort of slip out of the picture. There's this totalizing focus upon the, the specific microorganism. Mm. Um, I mean, I think partly that's due to them having real constraints upon their Upon their time and what they were able to actually do in Hong Kong, but it was was this sort of tunnel vision towards um, towards the specific microorganism, and then the and then the problems that that posed. So you know other uh, perhaps intermediary forms, um, but those followed from that initial direct focus upon the specific the specific microbe. Hmm. I would suggest, but that's mm -hmm. a really interesting question. And it's something I'll think about further. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you could say something more about the sugar cubes. Did I read that right? There's something about sugar cubes and I'm just, what, <laughs> what are they doing? What's happening? And it's obviously also, a, also a, yet another um, uh, food stuff of colonial viciousness. Yes. Um, so I think there was, I think that the resource constraints in Hong Kong um, required them to simply work with whatever they could, whatever they had at hand. So, I mean, among the animals that Hunter tests are some, um, um, you know, quite surprising ones, red beaks, for example, which I think are a local bird that they seemingly just collected and decided to subject to examination. And when he went about undertaking bacteriological tests on food in Hong Kong, 
It was simply an issue of, of walking to the local market and, and picking up uh, bits of rice and things. Um, and so I think with the sugar cubes, that was just this attempt at working out the possibility of plague um, causing disease through environmental contamination and um, the sugar cube just being uh, an, an, an easy way, an accessible way of testing um, whether flies or cockroaches within a given space have that capacity um, to infect. Um, so I don't think there's that, that speci specificity to the sugar cube um, beyond the fact that it was what they could get their hands on. And um, it, was, it was a method of testing that capacity for environmental um, uh, spoliation, I suppose. Um, but yes, um, a strange incident. Lots of this science is, uh, is just a string of strange incidents in many ways. Amelia, you, you've put your hand up. Oh, you're muted. Uh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed uh, both papers um, and learned a lot from them. Um, and uh, what struck me, and we've talked a bit about this, is are these um, competing knowledge paradigms, uh, how you mentioned the solidifying of dogmas of plague research and the hardening of disciplinary boundaries. And when you write about wrath theory, I kind of think of droplet dogma right now. And what I was curious about is you have this wonderful um, background on Dr. William Hunter, who I'm assuming is not the same as double, William W. Hunter in India, right? It's a different William different, Hunter. Yes. Yeah. And um, I was just wondering, did you find or come across any emic or local perspectives of these disease trajectories uh, mm -hmm. from uh, locals? And um, also in terms of transmission paths, I find it so interesting when when we started with the Wuhan wet markets and bats a year ago, we thought of it as like this: um, the transmission is through eating, right? But now we see that it's a respiratory virus. And so, on the one hand, you're writing about these gastrointestinal bacteria behind the plague, uh, but for COVID, we're increasingly seeing that it's more. Um, in, through inhalation and then I'm just too ignorant to know how that happened from the wet markets because it was in the open or was it closed like if it was through inhalation how did it come from the bats or the pangolins um but that's I'm not a, a, at all first in that kind of world um and and then the last thing that goes to this is in terms of transmission paths and the knowledge paradigms is did you find what were the politics of it like why did the rat theory prevail like what who were the actors supporting it and was there a strong contender and I mean we see that very now you know there is this entire the two extremes are the great Barrington declaration on the one hand and then zero covid which is now being cast as this kind of fringe crazy thing. Uh, so the, the, the politics is so clear when you're in the middle of it. And I was wondering what the politics were at that time. Thank mm, you. Yes, thank you. Um, really interesting, really interesting questions. Um, on your first point about the local perspectives, um, I mean, definitely, you know, you have important discussions um, in Chinese, from Chinese medical perspectives regarding um, regarding plague. I think less from Hong Kong itself, but certainly from the surrounding region. So there are important books on plague written by Chinese authors in, in Guangdong and, and elsewhere. Um, and in many ways, I think it's true that when you have the initial outbreak of plague in Hong Kong in 1894, and actually leading for a, a good decade after that, you have this um, sort of use or influence of Chinese ideas regarding the disease, um, always set at a distance, so often accompanied by statements of disavowal or doubt, but in many ways it's the Chinese perspectives that are setting the terms upon which the discussions are being held. So lots of the theories regarding the role of food in plague or the roles of say cows and, and pigs and rats to an extent, you know, those, those arguments aren't being made simply as a result of experimental processes. It's also because they've, they've heard 
um, rumors or they've seen they've seen works in which these arguments are, are being are being made in the Chinese literature, and that is sort of setting the the, the, the terms on which the, the thinking is happening. So I think you have that direct connection um, between sort of Chinese knowledge, to put it crudely, and um, this biomedical experimental science. Though the borrowing is almost always accompanied by a degree of, of, of disavowal and distancing. Um, but I think it's definitely there. Um, in terms of dogma and COVID, um, I think something I know less, I feel less comfortable speaking about when it comes to, you know, contemporary biomedical understandings of, of COVID. Um, but I suppose it's that attention to how, um, to how complexity is delighted in the search for a single actionable object or, or, or approach. Um, you know, perhaps today in the, uh, in the UK, for example, where you have vaccination as this, this sort of all encompassing thing, which shaves off and um, obscures lots of the other questions and, and, and approaches uh, to COVID. Um, it's a thing around which everybody sorts of uh, sort of congregates and um, sort of the, the broader connections, uh, entanglements of the disease are sort of lost in the, in the process. And so I suppose perhaps there are equivalent um, processes of, of, the, uh, of, of the application of dogma uh, today as there were, as there were then. Um, but that's sort of, sort of broad and something I'm a bit less certain about. Um, and then on um, transmission paths, could you remind me, what was your, what was your last question about um, transmission paths? So do you think, or have you come across how the um, the virus, because I've missed uh, most of your reading, so I just joined today first time, but um, so was it then the case that uh, animals transmitted the virus in these wet markets through exhalations, or was it, because as far as I know, COVID doesn't transmit through eating, right, because it's a respiratory virus. So I could I could jump in there and, and report back a little bit from our discussion um, last week with uh, Gary Cromary, which which we normally record for um, YouTube, but last week we didn't record it uh, for Christos's um, uh, request. So so Gary is a, a bat corona virologist, and um, among the things that we discussed is the new um, WHO report, and the WHO report um, did extensive um, inventorying of, of um, samples collected at the wet market, um, basically concluded it was the site of a super spreader event, much, much like a meat packing plant or, um, you know, the Amazon factories or, or other, other places that, that have seen super spreading moments. Um, but uh, they found evidence of, of 13 different um, strains. And, and what, a, what a strain means is, is um, in some ways difficult to decipher. In short, 13 different um, mutations were present in, in viral samples that were collected in Wuhan in December of 2019. So, so that basically suggests that at, at the moment that it was detected in Wuhan, um, it had already been spreading. So likely it originated somewhere else in, in, in China, Southeast Asia, or, or possibly even Europe. So the WHO report reviews evidence of various sorts from um, an antibodies, um, from PCR analysis um, that disrupt the, um, the timelines that were established early on in the pandemic about when, when it arrived in Europe. Um, so, so the, the jury is still very much out and um, the, the uh, last common ancestor between SARS-CoV-2 and RATG, the, um, the coronavirus strain found in bats, that last common ancestor according to D DNA um, clock techniques 
um, was somewhere uh, uh, between like 1949 and 1981. So a long time ago, there's a big gap in, in knowledge as it exists right now. So there's no easy, clear story to be told about, about uh, you know, bats and pangolins and a wet market at, at this point. Um, so there's two questions. Let's let's um, try to do both. I, I think we still have time. Sethke, do you, do you want to go ahead? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Jake. I have to admit that uh, I didn't have time and I quickly uh, skimmed your uh, papers, but uh, certainly I will read later on. Uh, so I have a specific question uh, about uh, fermented foodstuffs. Uh, is there were, was there any concern or somehow uh, uh, some somehow also were they uh, thinking about the fermented food stuff as dealing with these pet mi microbes uh, as way of sanitation as way of the uh, uh, having the uh, edible food stuffs? I'm just wondering. Mm. Was there any discussions about that? Um, so so how do you mean? Uh, sorry. I mean the. Fermented foodstuffs, as already Cesar and Evan was talking about this, all the microbial interactions that uh, somehow uh, can uh, uh, suppress the uh, the, uh, the microbes, which is uh, making disease. So this, not in terms of post post but in terms of the, as we know, of beer was quite important uh, for the uh, having safe drinking liquids. Uh, so was there were there some similar discussions for the not just uh, maybe drinking but for the uh, uh, other food stuff as well? I mean, fermented food stuffs. Is yeah, it clear? Um, so there was certainly attention to um, the preservation of foods. Um, so so pickled items, pickled vegetables, uh, preserved meats, um, sausage production. Um, all of these things sort of entered entered these perspectives, uh, but I think more than anything, instead of being anything particularly subtle, it was about those practices as having the as providing opportunities for contamination, and so you have Hunter decrying the um, putatively unscientific um, sausage making practices of the Chinese. You know, I don't know what a scientific um, scientifically produced sausage exactly looks like, um, but you have that attention to those um, those methods of food preparation. Um, but I think rather than pushing in any particularly um, interesting ways, it was it was mostly about whether these these practices are involved in in contamination, whether there's whether there are opportunities for the contamination of these foods by their contact with insects and rodents. Um, um, so, so more like that then. So, yeah. so they mainly had the quite negative starting point to look at. I think so. Yes, I think so. I think so. Thank you. Um, Amina. Amina, do you want to ask your question? Sure, Jack, thank you so much. Um, I'm gr quite grateful for this work and I'm going to go back and read a second time. Um, similar to Camelia's question, um, just wanting to think about what are the other powers and um, political or religious or sociocultural influences that might um, make rat theory attractive. So related to Linda Nash's work that you mentioned, um, her identifying a certain sort of um, developers, land developers greed um, in desiring to find ways to allay concerns about if we develop land too quickly, we might be impacting our own health. And so here comes germ theory as a tool um, to um, divide in people's imaginations the health of the land from the health of the body. And the way that that actually also relates to uh, white, uh, white identity, right? For white identity depends on the development of white identity. Um, at least this is a theory of, of, um, of some race scholars depends on separating the body from the land. So wondering if you could speak about any of those, um, not necessarily Nash's work or those things, but um, correlates to, to um, rat theory. Mm -hmm. 
yes um yes really interesting uh thank you um i think that is the i think um i think so the process is that investing all of your attention um in the rat is a great way of foreclosing expensive and time consuming questions over what else is going on in terms of transmission um and so the rat sort of takes on this on this role of of connector i suppose between um between the 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 body and its environment and that connection can be easily sliced off with practices of 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 rat destruction and and, and so on and so i think you know one of the ultimate reasons for the triumph of the of the rat theory was its ease of use and its ability to foreclose a lot of those other um, a lot of other, uh, those other discussions. Um, so simultaneous to the work of Hunter in Hong Kong, um, you have Patrick Manson um, advising the Colonial Office, and he he calls himself a, a monomaniac about um, rats and the destruction of rats. And I think that's very much a, a strategic action of getting the colonial office to, um, to, to commit to um, the destruction of, in order to, in order to um, win over the colonial office to action on plague by presenting the rat as this um, mm. actionable, solvable problem as opposed to these, you know, broad and complicated, complex entanglements between environments, different species and, and, um, and human health. Um, so I think that's what's going on there. Um, but also there's a, there's a I, I think it's also a way of um, um, simplifying the disease in the, in the colonial context of Hong Kong. So there's a comment by a colonial official where he says that he is very glad that scientists have identified the role of animals in disease transmission because it's something that can easily be presented to the you know, native population in terms that they will understand. Um, they might not understand bacteriology, um, but present them with the rat. And it's something that is, is, is easily understandable. And, and is again solvable. Um, and so I think, I think in Hong Kong, part of the you know, coloniality is, was built into uh, the emphasis on the, on, on the rat as opposed to more diffuse um, investigations. Um, but that's what I suggest there. It's a bit rambling, but, um, but really interesting question. And, um, and um, I think that's the key. The rat is sort of the easy solution to a, a difficult problem. So thank you again, Jack, for sharing these brilliant pieces of writing. Um, can't wait to, to see um, you know, the broader project as it makes its way into print. I think it's going to be an excellent book. Um, and uh, yeah, again, it's just a real a privilege and pleasure to, to be conversing with such an expert on these topics. So, so thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, and for next week, um, we've got Matthias Rest. And um, Rachel, do we have a time locked in yet with, with Matt?